Hello Paul Pounds. Thank you for joining me. So this is part two of uh, my look at the life and work of William Hope Hodgson and this is a look at a large proportion of his weird fiction. Now one thing I really love about William Hope Hodgson or his work is that you don't know what you're going to get. And I think this has put a lot of people off reading his stuff. And I hope this video doesn't put you off reading any of his stuff. The, there seems to be a reaction to his work that he's kind of like Marmite. I think a lot of the time you either read it and dislike it or read it and adore it and some of his stuff people read and adore and then grab another one of his books and really genuinely hate he also wrote um a lot of articles uh which i'm probably i'm not going to really get into here um he wrote a lot about photography uh, in its in its early days. He wrote a lot about naval life. If you've seen my um, my biography of William Hope Hodgson, which is on my channel, it's it, he spent a lot of time at sea, and it was a, an experience that shaped his life. Um, he was also a tremendous fitness fanatic, so there was a lot of articles about fitness which uh, I don't really know that much about, obviously. I'm built for comfort, not speed. Um, there's also He also wrote a lot of poetry. Now, I'm not a huge fan of poetry. I don't really get it. It's not for me. I like a story. Tell me a story. Don't, like, restrict the amount of words you need to use if you want to use words it's I just don't get poetry so the poetry of William Hope Hodgson is a discussion to be brought to you guys by a totally different person on YouTube it's not me so when William Hope Hodgson started writing fiction he uh, his, his first few published pieces were in magazines such as the Strand magazine, uh, no, the Grand magazine, which was a lot like the Strand magazine. Uh, stories like the Goddess of Death and a Tropical Horror. Some of which, like the Goddess of Death, seem like a fairly bog standard pulp fare, and then things like a Tropical Horror, you can see. Um, what would come in uh, books like Boats of the Glen Carrig and the Ghost Pirates. Now, since uh, William Hope Hodgson has achieved almost like cult status as being a, a, an auteur of the genre, I don't know what genre, because some of his stuff is all the genres but this he was writing them before specific genres really I think seem to exist so sometimes it's kind of like science fiction and sometimes it's kind of like epic fantasy but there's always always uh, an undercurrent of cosmic unpleasant horror not just creeping in there but as a as an important part of his fiction there's also his captain galt short stories which um are about a seafaring gentleman and they're more straight up adventure stories with sprinklings of mystery 
and allusions to supernature rather than being more recognisable as supernatural. And as much as I enjoyed them, I get the feeling that William Hope Hodgson wanted to write some more straight up nautical stories and maybe figured that they'd sell well and could make a few quid because this was his main job by this point. The best collection I think of his uh, his early unconnected uh, supernatural stories is the uh, one edited by Peter Tremaine, The Masters of Terror, Volume 1, published by Corgi. Um, I have constantly looked for any other volumes of Masters of Terror, but I don't think there are any. What a brilliant cover. It's lovely, that. For his early stories that are kind of unconnected and uh, I think what he was cutting his teeth on, I think that's a brilliant collection. Now, as always, I'm going to try and avoid spoilers. So if you're new to my channel and my videos, um, if when talking about the narrative and the plot, things seem a little bit vague, I don't, I, I'm, I want to talk about these books without just summarising the plot because if I make you excited about reading these books, then I want you to discover the the joys and the subtleties of strange unpleasantness for yourself. So 1907, The Boats of the Glen Carrig. So the Glen Carrig is a ship and it hits some rocks and ultimately the survivors of the shipwreck find themselves on a... Uh, strange and mysterious unknown island. This happens after a couple of uh, encounters with some odd uh, things that the, the ocean has and this island has to offer. So they get set and sorted on this island and then they're besieged by something. By creatures half, well, part slug, part seaweed, part mollusk. Yeah. One thing William Hope Hodgson was wonderful at was imagining the unimaginable, bizarre creatures. And what he also does, which I adore and wish happened more in any kind of storytelling, be it like radio plays, films, books, anything, it's not explained. These events occur. People in William Hope Hodgson's books are besieged by something or some things. But it's not we don't get that satisfying resolution at the end where it's explained and we're told exactly what the crack is there's a there's a film i'm sure some of you have seen it called insidious and for the first half i thought it was brilliant we're just exposed to mysterious and sinister happenings and we're as baffled as the protagonist we're on the back foot kind of not knowing what's going on so we can't it it baffles our brains and we can't figure out what's coming next you know with friday the 13th we know jason's coming we know he's got a machete we know what's going to happen but when when we don't know what's happening i think personally for me as uh, a massive fan of horror it, it amplifies that so with Insidious about halfway through the film a bunch of people, experts turn up and explain what the heck's going on and uh, big spoiler, it turns out to be a demon and then they know what it is so they can battle it and it's that 
it's that explanation, it's rationalising it. Even though maybe for you the concept of a demon existing is irrational, it's still rationalised it in some way because we know what it is narratively. This world that we're watching obviously contains demons and it's a demon. And the the power, the, the gravity, the fear is gone instantly for me personally and William Hope Hodgson gets that or got that and a lot of the time you don't get a resolution and you don't get it explained to you and you don't know what's going on and I genuinely love that in horror. Now for some of his fiction William Hope Hodgson did follow a formula, a format There's a lot of people besieged by things. Um, there's a lot of naval terminology. It's very obvious that William Hope Hodgson was a sailor um, because a lot of the naval terminology is quite like... It's dropped in casually as if you knew what he was talking about, but you do need a little, like, get your phone next to you because you're just going to need to keep looking on... Google to find out what these particular parts of the ship are and all that. There's also a bit of romance. Now, he does get criticised for dropping romance into his fiction. But it was it's something that was popular at the time. This was 1907 and... People liked romance in fiction back then. It was expected to be a part of fiction. And on a personal level, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It's quite nice. It's nice to be in love. And it's nice to feel loved. And obviously, for William Hope Hodgson, he, you know, decided to put that in. Maybe as a... An added level of threat. If there's someone that one of the protagonists cares about, genuinely loves, they're gonna they're gonna gravitate. You know that their their first instinct in a situation that contains peril is going to be to save them. And if you look online, a lot of the negativity for uh, Hodgson's work is his inclusion of of a bit of snogging and that. And I like that. I like a bit of romance. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that in fiction. But it's a product of its time. And that might, as a reader, that might put you off a little bit. It makes me quite happy. I quite like the refreshing break of, uh, you know, shipwreck, peril, peril, peril. Mm, bit of something, something. And then... Back to a bit more peril. It it It's like a little narrative palette cleanser for me. So I don't see it as a negative thing. I thoroughly enjoy the romantic aspects. Because I think deep down, just about everybody wants a bit of romance in their lives. If I've got any criticisms of the boats of Glen Carrig, it's maybe a bit long. But that's me looking at it, you know, from somebody that's reading it now. So it maybe wasn't in 1907. As a modern reader then, I think it could possibly benefit from uh, being trimmed and being a nice-sized novella. But that's just my personal opinion. So 1908 saw the release of The House on the Borderland, which is widely considered to be one of Hodgson's best works. And it's not just one of my favourite books. It is one of my favourite books, but it's not just one of my favourite books. It's one of my favourite things. It's one of the... Favourite 
things I've experienced in my life reading House on the Borderland. So, it's basically a manuscript found in an abandoned and dusty, run-down house in Ireland. And the chaps that find this manuscript start to look at it. And it, t it tells of this chap being besieged. Again, there's the whole besieged thing. But I like that. You know, like, it's something that maybe uh, George Romero often used it as a storytelling device. You know, Night of the Living Dead, besieged. Dawn of the Dead, besieged. Day of the Dead, besieged. Land of the Dead, besieged. It's something that works to build tension, I think. And I really don't mind the repeating besieged thing. So the manuscript talks, uh, this chap that's writing it, his, his house is besieged by bizarre pig-like creatures that are kind of like pigs, but not pigs. And his attempts to survive uh, this this ever-growing menace. But then, Hodgson drops in Cosmic Horror and... God, 1908... Is it 08? Yeah, 1908 Psychedelia. It, it's... I, I read it for the first time years ago. Years and years and years ago. And I'm still trying to make some sense of it in my head. I'm still trying to get my head around the intricacies and complexities of it. One thing I love about some of uh, William Hope Hodgson's fiction is that it could be a fictional thing. So, what I mean by that, I'm a, I'm a big fan of uh, Lovecraft and... Uh, all his works and the Cthulhu mythos and so these fictional tomes and the paintings by Edward Pickman Derby uh, and all that kind of stuff Lovecraft's no not just Lovecraft's because a lot of people a lot of uh, Lovecraft's friends contributed to the Cthulhu mythos There's these fictional things, these fictional uh, occult volumes or fictional uh, writers, painters, musicians that have channeled this strangeness of the great old ones kind of thing out into their, their creative efforts. And it feels like William Hope Hodgson's fiction could have been read by a character in a Cthulhu mythos story who then realises that this isn't fiction kind of thing and it's actually some kind of fever, truth, fever dream message from the Great Old Ones kind of thing. So then in 1909, The Ghost Pirates was published and... Um, it's kind of Hodgson kind of saw these three, these first three, as a uh, as an unconnected trilogy. It's a trilogy that you can read in any order as well. Um, but he did perceive them as a, a series of books. So the Ghost Pirates um, is about. It's essentially about a ship, the Mort Zestus. And this chap, Jessup, signs on this ship and, uh, you know, wants to see the world and do naval things, a bit like William Hope Hodgson himself. That's that's a thing, the bosun in uh, Boats of uh, boats of the Glen Carrig, the bosun is like a great and wonderful, dashing hero type chap, fit and sporty and handsome. There's often... A bit of a William Hope Hodgson. It's almost like uh, 
Hitchcock popping up in his own films, but Hodgson pops up in his own novels, but I think he's got more lines than Hitchcock ever had in his. So this chap signs on the signs on the uh, Mort Zestus and starts to notice odd things. There's shadows moving and strange and unusual things happening. And when he tries to talk to the rest of the crew about it, he's kind of shut down quite quickly and quite firmly. I'm guessing older sailors from this era were maybe a superstitious lot, and rightly so, when your life is at sea. And I think The Ghost Pirates is lovely because it's a really gentle unfolding as the sinister tension builds and builds and builds. And essentially it's about the crew of the ship being besieged. Yes, we've got more besiegement. Thanks, William Hope Hodgson. By... Well, I'm guessing the title would suggest it's Ghost Pirates, but it's not quite as straightforward as the Pirates of the Caribbean type ghost pirates. It's... It's strange, glimpsed, unpleasant creatures that, again, are never explained. They're never... They're never spoken about by uh, a third-person narrator type thing. So we don't know what the heck they are or what's going on. Which, again, I really, I really love that. We don't need the magic of the supernatural explained to us in great detail. I love it that... People are people are trapped somewhere, either on a boat or on an island or in a besieged house, and something's happening. And I can tell you what they see because it's there, it's coming at them. But that's all you're getting as any kind of an explanation. And that, for me, is beautiful. I think The Ghost Pirates is one of his more accessible uh, books. And often seems to be a good place to start if you're interested in William Hope Hodgson. And then we come to the Nightland. Now, I don't know what the Nightland is. I... The Nightland is a sprawling, baffling, brilliant thing. It doesn't even feel like a novel sometimes. It's a huge novel. So, this was nine, This came out in 1912. Before structured fantasy, science fiction, cosmic horror was a thing. And the sun is dead. The sun's just about done. And the remnants of humanity, there's quite a few left... They gather in this... They they live in a giant metal pyramid. And they need the giant metal pyramid, which is powered by kind of this geothermal energy that won't last forever. And their technology... it's, it's, It's like millions of years in the future, but in a way that just makes it feel otherworldly. So outside the gates of the pyramid are the Watchers. And the Watchers want in. We don't know what the Watchers are. They are kind of described in a unknown, formless, odd way. But they want in. And they are horrific and terrifying. The last remnants of this power that's generated manages to protect the last survivors of humanity from the Watchers. And then they get a message 
from another readout of survivors. There's another group somewhere. And one of the people from the pyramid sets out to find them. And that is all I'm going to tell you plot wise, but we're going to discuss aspects of plot. So I'm sure I'll give some away. So the Nightland, I don't want to put you off, but I want to put you off. If that makes any kind of sense at all. It's a brilliant book. It's bordering on the genius. Again, this is all in my humble opinion. But it's also the most infuriatingly drab. And it's a turgid slog to get through it. Which is frustrating and puts you off wanting to read it. But it's also brilliant and genius at the same time. It's a total oxymoron. I'm sure you figured that this unnamed protagonist goes off to find more on this dying earth. And a lot of it is his journey. The shades of Lord of the Rings there, isn't there? And, but because it's so long and so in depth and so, like every, every aspect of his journey is described. And because it's a slog to get through it, you almost feel, well, I do as a reader, you feel like you're actually, oh, it's a cheesy thing to say, I'm sorry. You feel like you're actually there. Not because of how the language is written, but because it's a slog for this dude. His whole journey is a challenge. And reading this book is a challenge. It's a rewarding book. It's got moments of absolute horror perfection for me in there. It's got moments of... There's not many books that genuinely scare me while I'm sat reading them. William Hope Hodgson has written two that have unnerved me whilst I was in the process of reading them. There's things that I've read, there's books that I've read that have got in my head as like a little horror brain worm that when I've been sat on my own in, you know, like in my house and it's night time and it's dark and there's a creak and your brain goes, oh, is it that thing from that book that was really creepy? And that's not necessarily while I'm actually reading them. That's just my little brain worms kind of burrowing further into my psyche. Whereas William Hope Hodgson actually wrote words that while I was reading them, I became disturbed. And that happens in the Nightland. Um, and it's brilliant. But it's arduous to get through. And I know I'm sat here saying, it's flipping genius. It's chuffing horrible. It is. When you, if, if you guys have already read it, or when you do read it, it is, it's absolute genius. And the opposite of that, I, it's very difficult to explain. If you're going to read it, you don't don't read it as like a curiosity of weird fiction. Read House on the Borderland as a curiosity of early weird fiction that's just bizarre and defies any genre. You've got to engage with the Nightland. You almost have to enter into a relationship with the Nightland. And it's not always the nicest relationship. 
you tackle it. Not like a, oh, I'm going to tackle this steak. You physically run at it and rugby tackle the 500 page git to the ground. It's a bizarre experience. But if you finish it, I the first time I finished it, I felt it was almost like an achievement, like a like a parachute jump or a bungee jump or something, a badge of honour that you can say, I got through it. And you do feel like that epic journey was partly yours. Now, with a lot of Hodgson's fiction, there's a lot of romance. This is his most romantic uh, endeavour. I think that he wrote um, the, a, a large chunk of it is a love story. Um, I think it's a love story that starts off not a love story, but develops into that. But like I said before, it's not that's not a negative thing. And if you look online. A lot of the negativity for this book is that it becomes a schmaltzy romance. It becomes a trite love story. But I don't think it does. I think it is a romance and is a love story with horrific and terrifying and bizarre elements in there. But there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing at all. It'd be almost like saying, you know, James Bond likes, he's got an eye for the ladies. You know, it'd be like saying, oh, I watched James Bond, but uh, Roger Moore kept snogging lasses. It's, it doesn't stand out as a weird thing. And it doesn't stand out as a weird thing in fiction from 1912 and in fiction generally. And um, maybe, maybe researching this video, I've read too many criticisms of, that people have of romance there's nothing wrong with that feeling when you're reading fiction and yeah romance figures in the nightland as much as the weird and supernatural and cosmic horror and strangeness that really affects your brain having said that and I don't normally approve of this. This is a very bizarre thing. The uh, uh, Valentine Adult Fantasy, which is in two volumes, which is nice because it feels like it's broken down a little bit, uh, is actually slightly re-edited by Lynn Carter. Now, ordinarily, this would be something that I'm like, you don't do that. But I think to make the Nightland a little bit more accessible, some trimming is, is advantageous. So in his introduction uh, Link to, to these volumes, Link Carter's talking about C.S. Lewis and why the trims were necessary. C.S. Lewis, another admirer of this remarkable novel, noted that it bore certain flaws. The maudlin love dialogue scenes, for example. These scenes occur only in the second half of this very long novel, but they are Victorian sentimentality at its nadir of taste, and in the opinion of many readers, myself among them, they severely injure the cumulative power and movement of the story. My publishers have judiciously trimmed these scenes of their most excruciating emotional excesses. I have closely compared the edited version of these few scenes with the original version, and in my honest opinion, Hodgson is improved by a little pruning. So, if you're thinking, maybe, ooh, right, so the Nightland is... A weird oxymoron, brilliant and frustrating at the same time. And if you can get them, these uh, Lynn Carter editions, they're normally about, uh, you can normally get them each for about 15 to 25 quid nowadays. They're the ones, I think, 
don't again I like to find the original things I don't like things remixed or remastered or but with the Nightland I don't think it detracts from William Hope Hodgson's original vision now that's just my personal view you might disagree so lastly we're going to come to it was published in 19 well it was published okay it's Karnaki the Ghost Finder there was a small selection of Karnaki stories published in 1909 and then uh, again in 1913 with more stories added as Hope Hodgson continued to write more um, Karnaki stories and then I think the Arkham edition in 1943 is the complete Karnaki and uh, it's the Arkham edition that keeps getting reprinted like Wordsworth Classics has done one you know the 299 ones and Karnaki is brilliant Karnaki the Karnaki stories are straightforward brilliant thrilling exciting pulp short stories about Thomas Karnaki who uh, is a ghost finder Karnaki the ghost finder obviously um, he uses technology his own technology that he's made he uses a gun he's uh, quite a, a bold and brave adventurer in the supernatural there's obvious obvious comparisons to John Silence, Blackwood's uh, supernatural detective, but I think Karnaki is different enough, and the Karnaki stories uh, stand up to close scrutiny by fans of the occult detective genre. Karnaki's a bit of a man out of time. He's more of a like 19th century kind of guy than a 20th century kind of guy. Maybe that's what appeals to me being a gentleman out of his own time and a little bit lost in the modern world. So the Karnaki stories lurch from more traditional clanking chain gothic fair, again right through to cosmic horror, bizarre total cosmic horror with shades of detective stories and crime tales in the middle somewhere. So the, the, these stories, they're, they're just Karnaki's adventures. And he is presented with a mystery and then goes to explore it and uncover the solution to the mystery. Sometimes it's supernatural and he sorts it. Sometimes it's supernatural and heck no, he doesn't sort it out because it's this impossibly powerful, bizarre thing. Sometimes it's... Uh, uh, human agencies sometimes it's a fake sometimes it's like scooby-doo and you don't know what you're going to get and that is what frightened me when i was reading the karnaki stories specifically the hog that genuinely when i was a lot younger and living in a tiny little lonely bed sit when i'd first moved out of my parents house and probably a little bit worse for wear chemically I remember reading, I got the Panther Karnaki and read that and it was the, the hog genuinely frightened me while I was reading it and that's such a wonderful memory to read words and be frightened by them. It's perfect. And it's the not knowing of the Karnaki stories that I think is wonderful. It's the, he, he, he just turns up and it might be a gang of thugs trying to warn people away. It might be a ghost that he can help lay to rest. It might be some bizarre supernatural identity that no human has ever encountered that operates in ways that are alien to us as humans. For nearly all of William Hope Hodgson's fiction, I think there are obvious influences on H.P. Uh, Lovecraft. And Lovecraft did write about um, Hodgson in supernatural horror in literature, which if you haven't got, it's quite dry. 
but there's so many wonderful forgotten authors and stories. For all his faults, Lovecraft knew horror and understood what was brilliant horror. This is the Dover Thrift Edition that you can get for a couple of quid. And this is the copy I've had for decades. And it's almost like a guide to early weird fiction. Now, in that, Lovecraft plays it down a little bit, plays his, uh, how much Hodgson influenced him and criticises the Nightland and praises House on the Borderland, as I'm sure if you've got any older copy of House on the Borderland, it's got a quote from Lovecraft on the cover. But I think it's that unknown uh, creature, something we've not encountered yet. And something we can't explain. That Lovecraft took that and ramped it right up uh, to the point where he'll spend pages explaining how unexplainable the whole thing is. And it's always nice going back. And I'm a big fan of Lovecraft, huge fan of Lovecraft. And it's nice to go back and see what I think some of his biggest influences were I honestly don't know where William Hope Hodgson pulled a lot of this stuff from it's it's mad genius but it might it might just be me I have a crippling fear of unknown things under the sea so I don't even know what I'm frightened of, but the idea of that surface that we see and then underneath it, there could be things beyond our imagination. Oh, I find genuinely disturbing. And things that I find genuinely disturbing like that, I love them to be incorporated into the horror that I consume, be it films, radio plays, books, whatever it is, if it touches on a genuine fear of mine, I love it even more. And you get the feeling that William Hope Hodgson experienced things at sea. And I said before, I know mariners are a superstitious lot and you can completely understand why, rightly so. But when you when you delve into William Hope Hodgson's stuff and read a lot of it, you kind of get the feeling that maybe when he was at sea, he saw more than he's letting on. And after all, he did just quit one day. He just quit his life at sea came home that's it opened his uh, school of physical exuberance or whatever it was I can't remember now and there's a little part of me that kind of wants to think that some of these mad horrors that the protagonists in these novels and stories come up against William Hope Hodgson maybe just maybe, came up against the same things himself. And that's why he quit working on the ships. And his novels and stories were almost like therapy for him, where he could let out some of the things he's experienced and seen during his life on board ship. That's what I like to think it is. Anyway, I'll leave it there, you lovely lot. I hope you have a fab Christmas and I will see you splendid folks in the next video.